people see me, they think I'm a, a lot younger than I am, you know. Hi, I'm Leila Tehran. I'm an Iranian living in London, and I have been vegan for over six years. My name is Tori Washington. I am currently living in Miami, South Florida. I've been vegan for about 22 years and Jamaican heritage, but I also was pretty much, my career background is I'm an engineer at heart. So that technical aspect is what goes into everything that I do now. I was raised vegetarian and my mother raised us vegetarian because that was the label that existed at the time, but it was part of her religious belief. And her religious belief was Seventh-day Adventist. And as a Seventh-day Adventist, natural eating from the earth was the way to be healthy. So being raised that way and falling into line with the Rastafari movement from my Jamaican heritage, Aitab, Aitab being living off the land, natural, not using sugar or salt to, for the food, just use the spicing herbs and vegetables and roots from the ground and fruits from the trees to nourish the body. I learned that a lot of Rastas would say they're Rasta, but not really Aital. I didn't want to be a hypocrite. And so I decided to make sure that if I'm going to call myself Rasta, another label, of course, that I couldn't be hypocritical in that and using that term and decided to make sure that food that I took into my body was only from the earth. And then later on, I was kind of schooled or taught that that's called being vegan. Vegan is not a terminology that I actually knew about because, you know, we now seem to live in a world where everybody lives by labels. We got to label this, we got to label that. And instead of people identifying themselves as a human being and an individual, we have to jump into this label. So I didn't know what the label was. People were like, oh, what do you eat? How do you eat? And then when I would explain something, I said, well, it's like being vegan. I thought vegan only had to do with what you ate. And it's not until I was introduced kind of, not in a good way to that it's more than that because people almost make it a religion, which in and of itself, I don't agree, necessarily agree with that because then it's like forcing it upon people. Mm -hmm. And I was at a veg fest and getting some food from a food truck. And a lady saw my shoes, my boots at the time, which were Timberlands, you know, Timberlands are made of leather. And she said, are your shoes vegan? And I looked at her crazy because I'm thinking, why would my shoes be vegan? I'm not gonna eat them. And not until then, I kind of understood the whole plight. Of course, I would never bash someone for wearing leather or fur if that's something that they are misinformed about. And if they want information, that can help them on that, but not necessarily make them seem to be out to be a bad person for doing that, if you know what I mean. So that's how I became into the vegan lifestyle. I went vegan in 98 and I started bodybuilding in 2009. See, I have been sort of athletic most of my life because I started out with track and field, played a little you know, recreational football, which is soccer in the US and so I loved running. And so I got into working out prior to going all the way plant-based, but because I was a student of learning about it. I studied Arnold Schwarzenegger. I was studying magazines and, and learning about training. And I was already working out, but I, wouldn't, I didn't compete. And it's not until I saw one of my colleagues from when I was younger compete at a place close to where I was living at the time. And it inspired me to get back into that mindset of, you know what, I don't want to get to the end of my life and say I should have. And I think a lot of us do that. You know, man, I should have done that. I wish I did do that. And I didn't want to say that. I wanted to say, you know what, I did everything I wanted to do. I went here, I competed in a bodybuilding show. And that one show inspired me to do another because I got third place. And I said, oh, maybe I can get second place. But I ended up getting first place and winning the entire show, getting my pro card for my second show. And that was it. Next thing you know, I'm doing this ever since. 
when I first did my first competition, the person I asked to help me, they're like, but you're vegan. And I was like, and I didn't even think that was a problem, you know, because I was doing fine. So it's not until people started bringing it up that it even came to my mind. And now, you know, the next thing now is, well, what about your B12 and anti-nutrients and this, that, and the other? Oh, you're not going to get enough calcium. Your teeth going to fall out. Da, 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 da. It's so crazy. And the typical standard American diet, because I don't use that word either, is burgers, potatoes, maybe some vegetables. And they're not concerned about their calcium because they're drinking milk. So they feel like, oh, I'm getting my calcium. And as long as I'm getting some meat and some, some starch somewhere, I'm good. And that's what people eat all the time. And then when you go plant-based, where you're getting multiple varieties of plants and fruits, they're worried about you. But I think the misconception was that all vegans that ate that way were super skinny. So that's what made, it's like it embranded that image in the minds of the population. And how often do you work out? Five to six days a week and about an hour to an hour and a half. So it's not actually a lot. No, it's consistent time under tension. And I think what people forget is it's consistency. And they're not consistent because like you just talked about, the microwave mentality, is, it's not happening to not happening fast enough so they will either take enhancement products like drugs to increase muscle protein synthesis so that way they can build muscle faster or they just say you know what i'll be fat and happy and also i think here a lot of people they don't know how to train properly i think that also i was just about to, that was my next thing perfect practice mm -hmm. so what i mean by that is it, you have to have the form proper form, proper training efficiency, and practice that all the time. Because a lot of people just go in the gym and they're afraid to ask for help. Or they, they say they can't afford it, but they'll spend money on things that aren't benefiting them versus spending money on something that can benefit them for years to come. If people uh, think that actually just by having protein, they put, uh, build muscles. Right. If it was that simple, the whole world would be full of Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. Because that's always a question. How much protein are you getting? What's the best protein to take? What? So are you taking any supplements? Only thing I do every now and then is protein and BCAs. Mm -hmm. That's it. Only because my protein is so high. So in order to kind of increase my protein intake without further increase in my fat or carbohydrates. And I, I think you don't even track your protein, is that uh, correct? No, no, I do, I do when I get closer to a competition, which I'm doing now. Because protein has a thermic effect on food, basically, you know, the, I, what you take in, you only get about 70% of it absorbed. So to, to decrease muscle wasting as I'm going in a deficit, and it's because I'm going in a deficit that I increase it. So I'm doing right now about 195 grams at the most. I wanted actually to ask you about the idle lifestyle. Is that actually a spiritual practice or is it more part of a religion? Rasta is very spiritual and one with the earth, but a lot of the Rasta ideology comes from religious or biblical facets of Christianity or what have you. So a lot of the aspects of the Bible go into it. So that's where you get this lifestyle. Because they looked at the Nazarene vow, which is a, another one where we got the, the Nazarite grows his hair into locks and consumes only food from the, from the earth as well. Samson, you know, being that he only ate food from the earth, things like that. Rasta was never considered a religion. Not many Rastas, well, not many, not to say many. A lot of them don't practice that. You know, they, you know, they are still, they still eat chicken and fish. And that's the same thing I saw within the Seventh-day Adventist lifestyle, the Seventh-day Adventist religion, is that they, even though he talked about the health message, a lot of them were like, eh, I'm going to eat some pork and some chicken and I'm just pray over it.
In Jamaica, we have our ital, which is vegan. You know, it's, it's so clean. Even salt isn't used, um, which blew my mind going to Jamaica and trying this colorful food. And when it hit my palate, I was a bit like, oh, there's a big culture there that is growing. It's growing more and more rapidly. You know, speaking from a, a Caribbean background, food is everything in our homes. It's how we celebrate. It's how we get together. It's how we show our affection. It's how we show our love. When we look back on the history, you know, we're, we're looking back at slavery and the type of foods that we were eating and the scraps that we were given. We were eating vegetables predominantly and making other meals with scraps that we were given. So I think this isn't just for black culture. This is in many cultures where we were only really allowed to eat plants. So now when I, I travel around and even going back to India and, and looking at all these places, although there is a divide in India between veg and non-veg, it is a case of looking at meat as this wealthy product, a wealthy product. And I know speaking to my family, my black side of the family, it's this wealth. It's like if there's not meat on the plate, it's not a luxurious or special meal. I even have African friends that try to eat more plant-based and their family, yeah, it's like a poverty meal, poor man's meal, if it doesn't have meat in there. So I think not just our culture that has something to do with that, even when we look at royalty, right? We look at history of Henry VIII or wherever, and we hear about, you know, how he died with gout and, you know, all this amount of meat that showed wealth and power. And I think we know now that the true power is eating more plants. Centuries ago, the peasants ate that way. You know, they couldn't get meat. Meat was considered a luxury. Now, how is it eating plant-based is considered a luxury? That's, you see how it's just, that's odd how times change. Like, where did that come from? You think about beans, rice, those aren't expensive. Mm -hmm. You know, salad is not expensive. You know, if you buy lettuce, romaine, tomatoes from the store or supermarket or from a farmer's market, there are, you can get more abundance of it and it, you can utilize it right away. I think it's more about convenience when people look at it because I can run into a, a line at a supermarket, not a supermarket, at a fast food place in my car and grab it versus going home, preparing it and actually putting the love into the, to the meal. So a lot of times it comes down to convenience and people not making the time to do what is right for them. You know, the time is there. Everybody has the same amount of time in a day. It's what you do with your time that benefits you the most. Yeah. And think quick. Yeah. That's how we, that's, that's, we're in, I used to say, I heard the terminology, it's a microwave society. How quick can I get it? Did you notice any difference, you know, health-wise? Did you actually uh, notice any benefits? Not necessarily. The only thing I can say is that I was asthmatic as a kid. And that's so far gone, you know, people see me. They think I'm a, a lot younger than I am. You know, I'm 106 years old, just so you know. Sure. So the blue zones are, I th we've identified five populations around the world. And they have in common the fact that they have uh, 10 times as more centenarians. So people who live to and above 100 years of age, 10 times more than the rest of the population. And people on average live 10 years longer uh, than the rest of the world as well. And in combination with that, they also have very, very low incidences of diseases that plague our society, like diabetes, cardiovascular disease, obesity. They've really got the great combination because there's no point living longer if you're not living, if you don't have your health. Several things uh, come up. So first of all, their diets. So they are very, very plant-heavy diets, plant-predominant diets. They get about 65 to 70 percent of their calories from whole food carbohydrate sources, so your whole grains, your potatoes, and they have eat in abundance uh, fruits, vegetables, nuts, uh, and legumes like beans, pulses, lentils. They tend to exercise a lot, not engage in like going to the gym pumping iron, but 
sort of they're just moving around. They're doing their daily chores. They also put a lot of emphasis on having relationships. So friends, family, they have a close social network of friends. And that's also been very um, important for them. And they also have sort of spiritual. They're always also part of some sort of spiritual group or faith. I think it has to do with not only my nutrition, but your mindset, you know, rest, recuperation, getting outside, getting fresh air, exercise. All of these things play a critical and crucial role in your health and overall wellness. And so those things, I think, are, are very important as well as your nutrition. So uh, lifestyle factors that you mentioned, like nutrition, rest, exercise, sleep, are very important because in this day and age with modern society, it's, it's come to a point where we have to actively maintain good habits because the default of, of the way we live in society is, 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 is much uh, more unhealthful. And there's good evidence correlating these habits to a lot of the chronic diseases that plague our society, like heart disease, diabetes, cancers, depression. So it's very empowering to think that by changing these uh, or optimizing these habits that we can actually have an impact on some of our most feared conditions. So starting with, I like to start with sleep because sleep is the most, um, you know, it's, it's the cornerstone, it's the first step for me. Because without a good night's sleep, you can't, you don't have the energy to, to exercise, to, you don't have the attention to plan healthy meals. So the first step is getting good sleep. It's been associated with a better immune system. Even one night's you know, interrupted or bad sleep uh, does raise inflammation levels in the body. So, you know, and, and over, over many years, this can lead to, or at least contribute to a lot of the chronic conditions which have raised levels of inflammation. The optimum duration is about seven to nine hours. So you shouldn't get too little, you shouldn't get under six hours, and you sh also you can't get too much of it. You shouldn't get too, uh, more than nine hours because that's also associated with um, poor outcomes. And exercise for me goes hand in hand with sleep because one promotes the other. You get a good night's sleep, you can exercise better. And if you exercise, you sleep much better as well. So they sort of go hand in hand for me. And it has many effects, exercise. It can, um, first of all, it's very good for your cardiovascular system, so your heart and your blood vessels. It can lower your blood pressure and it can also reduce your risk of having a heart attack. It also lowers the amount of bad cholesterol in your blood and raises the amount of good cholesterol. So lastly, nutrition, maximizing the good stuff. So lots of fiber, antioxidants, um, minerals and vitamins, and minimizing the bad stuff. So stuff like saturated fat, trans fats, uh, LDL cholesterol, uh, oxidizing compounds like heme iron, plant-based diet, sort of gives you the best of both worlds. It gives you the most of the good stuff in as, with as little as the bad stuff. Hi, my name is Angel. I'm Puerto Rican and I've been vegan for five years. If you look into bodybuilding, the top guys have the same skin color as I do. You know, you definitely want to have someone to identify with when it comes to something you want to do. Everybody's unique. Some people don't need that. Some people are go-getters. They're self-motivators and they take initiative. Whereas others wait for someone to give them the go ahead, you know, for them to say, oh, I can actually do it. Versus some people are like, I can do it, regardless if you think I can or can't. And when I went to my first job as an engineer, when I was in college, most of the people that looked like me told me that you would have to cut your hair to get a job. And I was like, no, I won't. I'm not gonna bow down to that. And I ended up getting not one, but two jobs. And I had many offers and I worked in corporate America for 14 years with my hair just like this. So basically, I didn't allow people's perceptions or people's fear to stop me from moving forward and going and getting a job. And next thing you know, they hired more people like me because like you said, they're the prejudice place on a certain look too because of the perception that's given by media. On my hands, I could count how many black people have been in my yoga class. I feel like possibly if I would have had role models that looked like me when I was little, I would have probably got there a lot sooner. So I think I'm hoping to, to keep encouraging, you know, influencing, whether it's shopping, whether it's buying food, whether it's doing yoga, whether it's going back into school. I'm hoping, you know, little, little 
me will be like, oh, I can do that too. Most people are not happy with their lives. So they look to see someone who's successful, what they're doing and just want to kind of live through them. That's why a lot of these reality TV shows and all these different television things do so well. It's because it's an escape from your life. And I think once people can get happy with themselves, then they'll look to be happy. And it's not until they get there, it's going to be a, a, a tough battle. Honestly, if you look at Egyptian history, they ate like this too. So it's been in our DNA, but we have been given this idea that is expensive and you have to have a certain type of background to get it. And unless you're a celebrity, you don't eat like that and all that type of stuff. So it's, 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 it's not just a one, a one, one answer. It's so many different facets to making it seem doable and not this big um, mystery mm -hmm. to be in vegan. I want vegan to get to a point to where you don't have to call it vegan anymore because it's just the way it is. That's the way that majority of people eat. Now we have pescatarian you know, carnivore, vegan, vegetarian. So we have all these different labels around eating food when we should just be eating what the body was designed for. And I think when we can get to that point, that's when we know things have changed, where we're not, so you're vegan. You know, it's more like, wait, you eat meat? That's weird. Who motivates you or what motivates you to kind of live the lifestyle you do? Continuous improvement. I just want to always improve upon my health, the betterment of humanity, and, you know, serving and sharing my journey with others. So I continue on this process like, because it's a process. I'm still learning. Mm -hmm. You know, I learned from one of my mentors that if you're green, you're growing. If you're ripe, you're rotten. And I'm always growing. This is a very interesting question because I'm just, I like food. I mean, one of my favorites would be pizza. Mm -hmm. I love pizza, but I love also sweets. I have a very, 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 very big sweet tooth. So I, I love donuts and cookies and, you know, puddings and mousses and milkshakes and all those types of things, ice cream. So those are probably one of my favorite foods to eat. I'm near a, a vegan bakery right now. It's right, it's right here. So, yeah, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run in there and grab some things for my son. So. <laughs> Good for maybe you. One thing, maybe one thing for me. Thank you so much. It was really fun talking to you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very, very much. I appreciate you giving me this opportunity to share my journey and oh, all the best to you.